from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, law, uh, the Library of Congress. Uh, my name is David Mao, and I'm the law librarian here at the Library of Congress. Thank you so much for joining us today for this celebration of the United States Constitution. Uh, but before we begin, I thought we'd take a moment and just uh, reflect on and remember the folks that uh, lost their lives yesterday right down the street, uh, I guess this way at the Navy Yard. All right, so thank you. Um, before we begin, I do want to uh, acknowledge the Friends of the Law Library of Congress, which has very generously supported our program today. Without their support, we would not be here. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Kim Fon, who is the president of the Law Library, uh, Friends of the Law Library of Congress. Kim, just raise your hand, stand up, and wave to everybody. Thank you, Kim. All right, so today is officially known as Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. And the day not only helps us recognize the ratification of the U.S. Constitution on September 17th in 1787, but it also helps us recognize all who, uh, by coming to this country and coming of age or by naturalization, have become citizens of this great land. As the oldest continuing constitution in the world, the U.S. Constitution is viewed as a document embodying strong institutions, democratic ideals, and principles of freedom. And the primary reason why so many people of the world want to be citizens of this country. So I want to quote from President Obama's proclamation last year on September 17th, uh, saying, Constitution Day and Citizenship Day allows us to celebrate our heritage as a country bound together by fidelity to a set of ideas and a system of governance first laid out in the American Constitution and lets us bring together community members to reflect on the importance of active citizenship recognizing the enduring strength of our Constitution and reaffirming our commitment to the rights and obligations of citizenship in this great nation. So in addition to this great program we have uh, for today on, to celebrate Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, the Library of Congress also launched th uh, through its uh, congress.gov platform today access to the Constitution of the United States of America analysis and interpretation also popularly known as uh, the Constitution Annotated or CONAN. Uh, it's a uh, written publication pu uh, prepared by the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress and published as a Senate document. For those of you that uh, may not know about CONAN, it contains legal analysis and interpretation of the Constitution based primarily on Supreme Court case law, and it addresses the meaning of all constitutional provisions uh, and is particularly useful to those who are conducting research on constitutional implications of a particular topic of law. So we've launched that today as part of our congress.gov website, but we've also, in addition, made it available as an app. So for those of you that might be interested, you can go to the Apple iStore, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the iTunes, or to um, the App Store for, for Androids and download the app and make use of this wonderful publication. So now we can uh, turn to today's program. That was my little commercial break there. Um, the Law Library, we are very, very delighted today to be able to welcome as a speaker the University of Virginia professor, uh, Risa Galyubov, to join us. Uh, many of you will probably remember her speaking at a Law Day program at the Law Library earlier this year, and she was just so fantastic earlier this year that we had to have her back to hear more from her about Constitution law and uh, hear her perspective on how social movements, judges, lawyers, legislators, administrators, um, and the like all work together to um, create a new understanding or an understanding of the Constitution. So let me tell you a little bit about Risa. She teaches constitutional law, civil rights litigation, and legal and constitutional history. She also directs UVA's joint JDMA program in history. She also has a very, very lengthy history of uh, just great accomplishments. So I'm going to just really name a few, and I'm sorry, I hope you don't mind. Just, just name a couple, because they're just really <laughs> a lot. Um, she in 2011, received the University of Virginia's All University Teaching Award. In 2012, she was named a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. And last year, she was also a visiting scholar at the Library of Congress's John W. Kluge Center, where she was conducting research on her book, 
um, talking about vagrancy laws in the 1960s and their impact on constitutional legal theory. And just to cap, sum up for you, uh, Professor Galyubov graduated summa cum laude from Harvard with degrees in history and sociology. She then earned a law degree at Yale University and then a, a doctorate in history from Princeton University. So she is eminently qualified to speak to us today about constitutional law and the history of it. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Galyubov. Thank you. I'm sorry, I meant one thing. I, I was supposed to mention to everybody that there were cards being passed around. Were they passed around? Did, did we pa okay, we did pass around cards for questions. So if any of you have questions, please feel free to pass them down. We'll collect them at the end. We'll, uh, when we have time for questions and answers, we'll, we'll use the cards. Thanks. So many microphones. So high up. Uh, Thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. Thank you all for coming today. And thanks to the Law Library, David, Robert Newland, Janine Kelly, Clifton Brown, uh, the Friends of the Law Library, and Kim Fong uh, uh, for having me today, inviting me to be here. And also a special thanks to Elizabeth Pugh and Roberta Schaefer, my uh, role models here at the library, who have uh, brought me into much of the life of the library. And it has been a wonderful thing. So I want to just acknowledge something that is a little bit embarrassing. I didn't know it was also Citizenship Day. I thought it was just Constitution Day. I would have given a whole different talk had I known. Uh, so this is my Constitution Day talk, and, and maybe one day I'll give a Citizenship Day talk. So as you know, today, September 17th, Constitution Day is chosen for the signing of the Constitution. And I was getting off the metro this morning, coming to the library to give this talk, and someone handed me a constitution as I walked out of the metro. And I was so delighted because it really connects to uh, part of the thesis of my talk today, which is about how we are all part of constitutional history. And so I'll be holding this up every now and then. Uh, so I think it's significant that the day that was chosen to celebrate Constitution Day is the day that it was signed, uh, the day that it was set on its path as a foundational document of this nation. I think that too often when we think about how the Constitution changes, my topic for today, we think about the most visible engine of that change, what people usually think of as the Supreme Court. I don't think it's wrong to think about the Supreme Court. The change that the court creates is quite visible. It's on the front page of the newspaper. It's put in big law books and bound for uh, students and lawyers to read. Um, and it, it's also not wrong because of how important the institution is. That institution's interpretations are incredibly important in that they do things in the world. They prohibit segregation. They allow health care reform to stand. They strike down part of the Voting Rights Act. Right? These are real acts in the world that have real influence on a lot of people's lives. The Supreme Court is also important because it influences how other people conceive of the document, how other people think about what the Constitution means, and therefore how change will continue to develop in the future. All that said, I don't want to talk about the Supreme Court today. I will a little bit toward the end of my talk. But what I want to talk about, and what I think Constitution Day offers the ideal opportunity to talk about, I'm looking for some place to put my Constitution. Uh, the ideal uh, uh, opportunity to talk about is everything else that goes into reading and rereading, interpreting and reinterpreting the Constitution. We sometimes think about other actors, not just the Supreme Court, other institutions or moments in the process, most particularly a band of lawyers who make some constitutional change. So we have stories that we tell about Brown versus Board of Education, or more recently about the same-sex marriage litigation, where an institution or a single lawyer or a group of lawyers decides that they are going to make some constitutional change, and they do. Now, I think the story is usually more complicated than that. My first book was about how it, the story was more complicated than that for Brown versus Board of Education. But overall, we get the sense of a deliberate strategy on the part of a small group of people to change what the Constitution means. It seems to me that a lot of constitutional change happens in a very different way. It happens with disparate beginnings, unconnected beginnings, many different actors who all come together perhaps later, but only contingency, contingently and possibly. So I think of, uh, as, as David mentioned, my book is about the 1960s, so I'm be talking about the 1960s, and that's where my head is a lot of the time these days. And I like to think of the campaign to end school segregation in Brown as sort of like the 1950s high school prom 
Um, it's organized, it's fixed, it has particular invitees, it is known even if it's contingent in many of its particulars. But when we all tell the story of Brown versus Board of Education, we risk becoming passive in that story. It's not a story about we, it's a story about them, the people who made that happen. The other kind of constitutional change, the one I think has a huge impact on what our Constitution means and which is incredibly prevalent in constitutional history, is more like a 1960s happening. Nobody really planned it, there's no real guest list, the entertainment is self-created, the location, the duration, the content are relatively spontaneous and open. We can all be, we can even host our own 1960 happening. It's not reliant on a great and visionary lawyer or organization, it's reliant on all of us. Hence, <laughs> this comes out at the Metro, right? Anyone can become part of this story. So I'm going to talk about that kind of change today, uh, the kind that I think happens quite a lot. Uh, and, and I'm going to answer the question, I want, what I'm going to do is answer the question, how does constitutional change happen in the big picture? And I, I'm going to tell you my general thesis, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my book and how I'm going to go about answering it. Here's my general thesis. I don't think it's that revolutionary. but. Constitutional change is the product of collaboration and conflict among different types of people and institutions. So let me spell that out a little bit more. The Constitution changes when people think there is a problem with the law. They discuss it informally among themselves or with growing confidence and agitation in social movements and organizations. They call upon lawyers to help them. The lawyers discuss the problem with their clients and with their colleagues. They read widely in law reviews and, uh, sorry, in law reviews, and call on their old friends on law faculties. They write complaints and briefs. They appear in court. They face adversaries who might contest, concede, or a little bit of both, people like police and prosecutors, senators and congresspeople, city council members and mayors, governors, presidents, and more. Only then do judges come into the picture. And even then, lawyers are more likely to stand before justices of the peace than justices of the Supreme Court. Trial judges and appellate, state court judges and federal all play a role. Now, in my view, there's no better example to use to show you how I think so many different kinds of people are involved in the constitutional change process than this book that I'm writing about now. It's tentatively called People Out of Place, the 60s, the Supreme Court, and Vagrancy Law. Most people don't think that vagrants, or others, as we'll see, it wasn't just vagrants who were arrested for vagrancy, uh, are the kind of folks who get constitutional change rolling. But I do, and I think my book shows that, and that's part of what I want to show you today. So here's a little background to the book, and then I will start breaking down that long paragraph I just read you and talking about the various people and moments that I see in the constitutional change process. I'm going to start with another document, much less illustrious than uh, uh, our Constitution. It's an ordinance, a vagrancy ordinance, that was in force in Jacksonville, Florida, as late as, but no later than, 1972. This is only part of the ordinance. I have edited it down a little bit for you. Rogues and vagabonds, or dissolute persons who go about begging, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays, common drunkards, common nightwalkers, thieves, pilferers or pickpockets, traitors in stolen property, common railers and brawlers, I'm still in the same ordinance, okay. Persons wandering or strolling around from place to place without any lawful purpose or object, habitual loafers, disorderly persons, shall be deemed vagrants. Laws like this one, vagrancy laws and related uh, loitering and suspicious persons laws that I will call vagrancy laws for our purposes today as well, came in many different forms, but this one is pretty typical. These laws came from medieval and Elizabethan England to the United States before it was the United States with colonists. They proliferated all over the country. Pretty much every state and city had some form of vagrancy or loitering law. There are two hallmarks to these vagrancy laws that you may have noticed as I was reading this ordinance. The first is that they are status offenses. Most of our criminal law criminalizes conduct. You have to do a certain act and then you are convicted of having done that certain act. Not so with vagrancy laws. The vagrancy law describes types of people. And did you notice how it's written, shall be deemed vagrants? Not are convicted of vagrancy, shall be deemed vagrants, and you are a vagrant forever. 
until you can prove that you reformed yourself and are no longer, you could be arrested every single day for being a vagrant. Uh, so that meant that the police could arrest whoever they wanted, basically on site, without them having done anything at all. And they did. The second hallmark of vagrancy laws is vague language. As you could see from the description I just read, there is pretty much no one who could find immunity from the, the, the ordinance I just read you. And this gave police officers pretty much unlimited discretion to arrest anyone at any time. And what that meant for police officers was that they could get around the Fourth Amendment's probable cause standard. So the Fourth Amendment says before you can arrest someone for a crime, you have to have probable cause that they've committed the crime. What do you do if you think that guy is about to rob a bank, but you don't have proof? You arrest him for vagrancy, and then you investigate. And that's how it went for many, many years, that uh, vagrancy laws were used by officials to get around the probable cause requirement. For centuries, officials employed vagrancy laws against anyone who seemed out of place in any way, and not just vagrants. They used vagrancy laws variously to regulate and extract labor from the resident poor, exclude and punish poor strangers, incapacitate apparent threats to the social order of any kind, prevent the commission of incipient crime, enforce the racial segregation and subordination, and discipline minorities, dissidents, and nonconformists of all stripes. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, vagrancy laws moved from a status of legal and constitutional legitimacy to legal and constitutional illegitimacy. In 1953, the Supreme Court for the first time considers a vagrancy law, and it dismisses it as improvidently granted, what the, those in the know call dig it, dismiss as improvidently granted. And over the next 20 years, the Supreme Court takes around a dozen other vagrancy cases and either digs them or finds ways to narrowly decide them so that it doesn't have to actually answer the question of whether vagrancy laws are unconstitutional or not. It's not until 1971 and 1972, after a whole host of lower, lower federal courts and state courts have struck down vagrancy laws, that the Supreme Court finally struck them down, strikes them down. Now, I don't mean to say that and you'll see this as I go through. It's not that I'm saying the Supreme Court is the arbiter of constitutional legitimacy, but it is the capstone in this story, as lots of other people had already determined that vagrancy laws were unconstitutional. And so I don't, I, I, it is not the case that everybody before 1953 thought vagrancy laws were legitimate, or everyone after 1972 thought they were illegitimate, but it, there is a huge sea change in the way most legal professionals thought about vagrancy laws in that period. The question of my book, then, is how does that change happen? How does something constitutionally legitimate for centuries become constitutionally illegitimate over the course of 20 years? In other words, how did the Constitution change such that vagrancy laws went from cons consonant with the document to incompatible with it? Now, my book will also go past 1972 and talk a little bit about what happens afterwards, but I'm going to focus on the 53 to 72 period in describing how I think the Constitution changes. Now let's go back and answer the question by going through the parts of that paragraph that I read to you in the context of this vagrancy law challenge. And I'm going to use several examples from the, my book, but I feel ambivalent about using them because there are so many stories that happen in this vagrancy law challenge, and I can only tell you a small number of them. But the point of this talk is not to tell you everything that's in my book, but to explicate how the Constitution changes. So please don't take this as a full understanding of what my book is about. Uh, it's not even a full understanding of how the Constitution changes. That's inherently partial, too. But I get closer to that. First, the Constitution changes when people think there is a problem with the law. People experience a harm. They decide that it is somehow a legal harm. And this is key. They think there's the possibility, however slim, that they can get it redressed, right? That the law can fix this harm. Now, the political and social context is key to whether and how people perceive that they have been harmed. Now, in the vagrancy context, it's not hard to see that there's been a harm, because most of the time, vagrancy cases begin with an arrest, so there has been a harm. But is it the kind of harm that the legal system sh should redress? A lot of the time, a person might say, you know what? 
I was being a vagrant that day. Uh, and, and they think it's a justifiable arrest. Or they may think it's an unfair arrest, but they're resigned to hundreds of years of vagrancy regulation, and they don't actually think that there's anything that they can do about it. So just being harmed doesn't create the conditions out of which constitutional change will start. There has to be some sense that the arrest is illegitimate under the Constitution, that the arrest needs to be challenged in some way. And even though there were thousands and thousands of vagrancy defendants before the 1950s, there were almost no constitutional challenges before the 1950s, right? So something happens that makes people say, wow, there's something wrong with these laws. I think that we should challenge them on a constitutional basis. So I'm going to introduce you to a few people and talk about their arrests and talk about how and why they came to see vagrancy laws as a constitutional problem. And there are different answers in the different cases. The first person is Sam Thompson. He's an African-American handyman and junk peddler in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. In, in the, his arrest happens in 1960, but over the course of the 1950s, he is a target uh, uh, of police harassment, often at the Louisville bus station. He's arrested many, many times, and he never complains. He is arrested. He does his time. He comes back out. People call it the revolving door, often for people like Sam Thompson, who was also an alcoholic. Um, but one arrest just didn't sit right with Sam Thompson. He was walking down the street minding his own business. He was not drunk. He brushed against another person walking down the street, and he later realized that person had stabbed him. And he appealed to a police officer for help. The police officer took him to the hospital and got him help, but then arrested him. And he thought, hey, that's not right. We all know when you're supposed to arrest me. And this wasn't one of those times I came to you, right? You're not supposed to arrest me at this time. He thought this violated the norms of what police peacekeeping uh, on Skid Row or places like Skid Row was like. So Thompson went to his employer. Just so happens, his employer, who he worked for as a handyman, was a man named Dr. Wynant Dean. And Dr. Wynant Dean happened to be a member of the Kentucky ACLU board. Whether Sam Thompson knew this or not, I do not know. But he, so I don't know whether he goes to him as his employer, a person who can be a patron and help him generally, or as an ACLU board member. But Thompson experiences a harm. He thinks it's an illegitimate harm. And this poor alcoholic man in 1960 Louisville, he sets the stage for constitutional change. He is the one who begins uh, the wheels of constitutional change happening. He's not part of a political group. He's not part of a social movement. He's lucky that Dr. Wine and Dean is part of the ACLU, but he is the beginning. I won't take out my constitution again and show it to you, but I would. Uh, I'm doing that metaphorically. Next, they discuss it informally among themselves or with growing confidence and agitation in social movements and organizations. Right? So social movements are key to creating a political and social context in which people experience a harm, think that it's redressable, and think that something can be done about this. So one of the most obvious examples in my book of this is Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who, uh, as the Supreme Court case that later talked about uh, uh, his arrest, describes him as a notorious person in the field of civil rights in in Birmingham. He was a co-founder with Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He had also done lots of, he was a major civil rights leader in Birmingham and elsewhere. And he was arrested for loitering when he was standing on a street corner for just a few moments. The, the testimony is in conflict, but the conflict is, I don't know, two minutes or 30 seconds. Uh, and he, it was during a boycott of downtown department stores in Birmingham in 1962. He's talking with some colleagues, and he gets arrested for loitering. He had been arrested many times before and after. And a few years earlier, when he had been uh, in jail uh, on, a, on an arrest, several ministers had visited his wife from, Bur uh, from Montgomery to Birmingham, and they were arrested in Fred Shuttlesworth's home for vagrancy. Ministers for vagrancy in Fred Shuttlesworth's home. So Fred Shuttlesworth is part of an ongoing movement, generally, the civil rights movement. That movement is in a pitched battle with the police, more specifically. And more specifically yet, that movement is in a pitched battle with the police over vagrancy and loitering laws. Right. So Fred Shuttlesworth clearly knows what's going on when he gets arrested. And he is ready. He's hooked into legal networks, and he's ready to challenge them. <laughs> 
The last example that I want to use uh, to, to talk about this particular aspect is a guy named Stephen Wainwright. And he, this shows how you don't have to actually be the leader of the social movement in order for social movements to affect a person. So Stephen Wainwright is a white Tulane law student who goes out to the French Quarter in New Orleans for a bite to eat around midnight one night. And unfortunately for Stephen Wainwright, he looks a little bit like a murder suspect that the police are looking for. The murder suspect has a born to raise hell tattoo on his arm. So the police come up to Stephen Wainwright and they ask to see his arm. Stephen Wainwright is a law student. <laughs> he's also from a family of lawyers and he also has a skin condition that he's embarrassed about. He says no. What happens? He gets arrested for vagrancy, of course, right? That's where your head goes. No, but that is where the police's head went uh, in the 1960s uh, in New Orleans as elsewhere. Now, he knew that the ACLU was interested in uh, criminal procedure cases as well as being a law student, and so he decides he's going to take his case, and he writes his own pro se petition initially to the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, the story of vagrancy change over this 20-year period is the story of the 1960s social movements, right? They are uh, what makes this change happen between 1953 and 1972. Vagrancy challenges came from pretty much every social movement of the time. So I'm just going to list some of them so you get a good sense of this. African Americans and other civil rights activists, Latinos, communists, labor union members, poor people, beats, hippies, gay men, lesbians, and other sexual minorities, women, Vietnam War protesters, student activists, young urban minority men, and other dissidents. I mean, that's a big list, right? All those people are bringing challenges against vagrancy laws. And the reason is because these folks who had been the prime targets of vagrancy laws, had been regulated by vagrancy laws for so long, are now organized, they're now assertive, and they now have lawyers. I'm going to talk about the lawyers again in a minute. And it turns out that vagrancy laws are obstacles to all their other goals, right? You're looking for sexual freedom or racial equality or you're trying to politically protest and yet you can't walk down the street without being arrested just because of who you are. You're not going to get very far. So at different moments in all of these social movements, people realize that the vagrancy laws are a problem and that they need to uh, challenge them. So part of whether something is understood as a constitutional wrong, as something about the Constitution that we need to change, uh, that we need to interpret differently, depends on the litigants themselves, depends on the social and cultural and political context in which the litigants are acting. Regular people, I'm holding up my Constitution, who decide to take action of one sort or another. Now, perhaps they're thinking explicitly about constitutional change, and perhaps they're not. Perhaps they're just thinking about a harm, and yet they set in motion uh, the processes that will become constitutional change. So who do they set them in motion with? The lawyers, right? Here we are to our next part of my statement. They call upon lawyers to help them. Lawyers don't always help people, though. They have lots of reasons to take cases or not take cases, part of which is just whether there are enough lawyers around or not. So take Thompson, right? He wasn't necessarily thinking that his harm was going to lead to a Supreme Court case, which it did, um, or think about constitutional change. But once he brings it to Dr. Wine and Dean, and Dr. Wine and Dean brings it to the lawyers in the Kentucky ACLU, they are certainly thinking about the Constitution, especially one man named Louis Lusky who was really the perfect person. Uh, uh, Thompson goes through one other person before it gets to Lusky, and that person says, you know what? This is for Louis Lusky. And so part of making sure that constitutional change happens is finding lawyers who think that you fit into their program in some way. Now, they might be willing to change their program because they come across your harm, but usually they've got constraints, opportunities, viewpoints that, you, that uh, a client may or may not fit into. So Louis Lusky was already complaining about police. He was complaining about the Louisville Police Court, which was the court in which uh, Thompson's cases were usually um, uh, prosecuted. He was already complaining about the informal court procedures and the cahoots with the, lawyer, uh, the, the prosecutors, the police, and the police court judges that left people like Sam Thompson at the risk of being arrested at any time. So when Thompson complains to Lusky, Lusky says, absolutely, your problem is my problem. This is a constitutional problem. Now, what happens after that is interesting. Louis Lusky takes Sam Thompson, or Sam Thompson takes Louis Lusky to the police court. 
lawyers don't go to the police court, especially lawyers like Louis Lusky, who had been a Supreme Court clerk. He'd worked for the most prominent law firms. He was a, he was a highfalutin lawyer, and they didn't see those at the police court. In fact, the prosecutor says at one point uh, during this very short trial, Your Honor, he's trying to make a federal case out of this. Did you know people actually said that? He actually said it. And he said it not once, but twice. Uh, uh, and so after this, so Thompson's perception is the police violated our kind of norm about when you arrest someone. Yeah, after that, the police said, you know what? You violated our norm, which is not to bring a lawyer to police court. And then they really started harassing him. And he didn't go to the bus station anymore. He went and I, I kid you not, I am not making this up, he went to wait for his bus at a bar called the Liberty End Cafe. And the police sought him out at the Liberty End Cafe and arrested him. So it's that arrest that ends up being a Supreme Court case. But they violated his norm. He sought help. He violated their norm. They retaliated against him. But the case continues. OK. Wainwright also finds his way to the ACLU, our Tulane Law student. Right? He realizes that he needs help with the case. He needs to get there. Now, what he doesn't know, he knows the NYU, uh, ACLU is generally interested. What he doesn't know is that since the 1930s, various ACLU affiliates have been taking on vagrancy cases all over the country in lots of different uh, contexts, radicals and workers trying to organize in California in the 1930s, beats and hippies in the 1950s San Francisco, gay men and lesbians, African Americans, prostitutes and narcotics users, mafia bosses, I could go on and on. So the director of the ACLU, Mel Wolf, the legal director, takes on Wainwright's case. Now, the centrality of lawyers to constitutional change, I think, it, it interacts in interesting ways with social movements, right? These, these various things that I'm talking about, I'm doing them one by one. But obviously, they're not one by one. They're all interacting. And one of the ways that they interact here is that the social movements create the conditions for more lawyers for the social movements. So the NAACP, the ACLU, lots of uh, uh, emerging gay rights organizations, they all have more lawyers now. Plus, you get the war on poverty. Lyndon Johnson creates the Legal Services Corporation. Suddenly, you have legal aid lawyers who can take the cases of vagrants and other poor people who are caught up in vagrancy laws. Uh, and finally, you get Supreme Court cases like Gideon versus Wainwright, uh, which uh, requires uh, defense lawyers for criminal defendants in cases be provided if they can't be paid for. So suddenly, you have three different uh, institutional bases out of which lawyers are coming to challenge these cases. And Shuttlesworth is a good example of this. The wheels of the Civil Rights Bar begin turning immediately. Local lawyers respond to his call. They call in national lawyers from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who are the lawyers who represent lots and lots of civil rights activists. So Jack Greenberg and Anthony Amsterdam from the national office come in. And they've already dealt with vagrancy and loitering arrests for other people. And they're ready to do it here as well. As lawyers take cases, and they make law, and they come up with arguments, momentum gets established, right? So you start with Sam Thompson. And Thompson v. Louisville is usually the first case that's mentioned when you see people talking about vagrancy law and the constitutional change that happens. They, momentum builds up. And there are lower court cases. And there are cases that just barely missed. And there are dissents at the Supreme Court and elsewhere. And lawyers start asking themselves, huh, maybe there is available doctrine. And people's sense of the possible changes. Uh, and as it changes, it changes more and more and more. So in 1960, when Thompson's case comes up, there's barely any precedent. But by the late 1960s, lawyers excuse me, are trolling for vagrancy cases. They say to themselves, this is a huge problem. The court is going to speak on this. And I'm going to be the one who brings the court the case that changes what the Constitution means when it comes to vagrancy laws. So one of these lawyers was Sam Jacobson in Jacksonville, Florida. Remember that Jacksonville ordinance? That was the ordinance that was going to go up to the Supreme Court, right? That ordinance was terrible, as were all the, the Florida law, state law and the various ordinances were all of the similar ilk. Um, so Sam Jacobson says, I'm going to create a perfect package. And the four people in his package who are at the center of it are two white women and two black men on a double date in Jacksonville, Florida in 1969. They get arrested for vagrancy. And the notation on the arrest form says, prowling by auto. Now, that wasn't in what I read you. And let me tell you, it wasn't in what I omitted either. Prowling by auto was not one of the 18 categories in the Florida vagrancy law. But did anyone care? No, that wasn't the point, right? So 
the, uh, the, the, the case, this is just after Loving versus Virginia has struck down anti-miscegenation laws, right? So Sam Jacobson thinks, how can they deny this? Police officers enforcing anti-miscegenation uh, policy after they've already said that legislatures aren't allowed to. So lawyers here are key. They're key because they're intermediaries. They're key because they're gatekeepers, right? They allow some cases in, but not others. They are interested in some problems, but not others. They take some clients, but not others. And all those choices affect how you get to the top. Sam Thompson doesn't always get there. And many people like Sam Thompson don't, right? He's got to find the right person. That person has to be interested. That person has to make the arguments. They have to know the arguments are available. So what happens next? How do they know the arguments are available? How do they decide what arguments to pursue? The lawyers discuss the problem with their clients and their colleagues. They read widely in law reviews and call their old friends on law faculties. They write complaints and briefs. They appear in court. The lawyers make their decisions on what academics like to call both internal and external uh, uh, bases, right? Part of this comes from the cultural context, the clients themselves, the social movements, their own, are they in private practice, or are they in legal aid, or are they a public defender? They're all institutional location in the world. But part of it depends internally on what's going on in the law, on what arguments seem available and which don't. So I wanted to give you one example of uh, an exclusion of cases that didn't come about. Uh, so as I mentioned, vagrancy and loitering laws were used against gay men and lesbians, especially gay men in public, uh, very, very frequently. But there are very few published cases in this period uh, in which those folks are challenging or even, uh, and even fewer in which they're winning. And that's because at the time, the sodomy laws were seen as the critical problem uh, among uh, gay rights activists, right? Sodomy laws that prohibited sexual activity in private. And the argument was, come on consensual, adult, sexual activity in private, that has to be constitutional. It has to be unconstitutional to prohibit that. But if that's your argument, just let us do what we want to do in private, it's a lot harder to say, and also all that public stuff, don't, 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 don't prohibit all that public stuff too, which is what the vagrancy laws were about. So making arguments about sodomy and emphasizing all we're asking for is a right in private makes it really hard to then say, actually, we want rights in public too. Because the vagrancy laws were sometimes about what happened in private, like Shuttlesworth's home, uh, but most of the time they were about public acts. And so those cases, there are a few of them, they fail. There are a few of them, uh, but they are very few and far between. So in deciding which cases to take and which arguments to make, clients aren't the only factors. There are also all these so-called internal factors. And I just want to mention a few of those. Because over the course of the 1960s, and, and they're obviously the internal and the external are related to one another. There's a reason why they're changing at the same time. A ton changes in the law at this time. There are new visions of the First Amendment and free speech, new visions of policing, criminal justice, and the protection of defendants' due process rights, new visions of the role of substantive criminal law in maintaining crime control versus cr social control, new visions of labor and poverty of their causes, of people's rights to choose about how to participate and whether to participate in the labor market, of pluralism, nonconformity, and privacy, and of anti-discrimination and equality. So these legal developments are changing at the same time as the social and political developments are, and the two are reflecting one another and propelling one another forward. So Anthony Amsterdam, who was part of the NAACP's national office, uh, is the best example of this. He gets involved with the NAACP after publishing a student note that is still one of the most cited articles ever, a student note. He wrote it in just a few weeks. It's quite an amazing thing. About a constitutional doctrine called void for vagueness, that if a law is too vague, then it can't be constitutional. How can there be due process if you don't even know that what you're doing is criminal? How can it be there be due process if the law enforcement officers have no way to decide who to arrest and who not to arrest? Then they become arbitrary and discriminatory in their decisions. So Jack Greenberg, the legal director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, says, we need that guy. That guy knows what he's talking about. And Amsterdam moves between the academy and law practice and the civil rights movement back and forth, back and forth. And he also serves as a link between the various kinds of vagrancy law challenges. He's involved in 
the civil rights struggle, Vietnam War cases, criminal procedure cases. He's involved in all of these. So when I say, well, the way constitutional change happens is often disparate and unconnected, I don't mean it stays disparate and unconnected, right? There are people, there are institutions like the ACLU and the NAACP, particular people, particular social movements that cross-pollinate um, uh, and help network uh, across individuals and movements so that what begins as a discrete problem, Sam Thompson, a kind of skid row guy, getting arrested for vagrancy, he's drunk. Suddenly, you're talking about Fred Shuttlesworth. Suddenly, you're talking about Stephen Wainwright. Suddenly, you're talking about hippies, right? You're talking Vietnam War. Pro Suddenly, you've assimilated all different kinds of people, and you see they're all talking about the same problem with the Constitution, that the Constitution shouldn't allow these kinds of laws. They're not talking about discrete things. They're talking about the same thing. Uh, and that's a key moment in how constitutional change happens. Now, the contours of the Constitution, of changing the Constitution, are a function not only of those challenging interpretation, but also of those defending it. They face adversaries who might contest, concede, or a little of both, police and prosecutors, senators and congresspeople, city council members and mayors, governors, presidents, and more. And the question here is, what do they defend? When do they defend? Which parts of the constitutional order do they want to retain? Do they think it's really important to retain? So for some, the defense is total. Bull Connor. Bull Connor is committed to these laws, right? He's the infamous sheriff of Birmingham. Uh, he is committed to these laws. He is. He, he says, we don't give a damn about the law. We are going to use vagrancy laws when people like you come into my seat. I have a quote. I'm not going to read the whole quote because I'm running out of time. But he says this, right? Others are more equivocal, more nuanced. They say, oh, we used to do that, but we don't do it anymore. Oh, this arrest? I, I can't explain that because we don't do that anymore, right? And so people are quite clear about their positions. And the one thing that uh, over the course of this 20-year period, it becomes apparent that the defenders really want to defend is this workaround around the probable cause requirement. That we might be able to say, fine, I can't arrest a hippie, or I can't arrest a protester, or I can't arrest someone I just don't like the way they look, or the public drunk, maybe he needs help and not prison. But I need to be able to arrest the guy I think is about to rob the bank. And we have to figure out how to do that. And so a lot of what happens right around 1972 and then afterwards is how do we reconfigure the Constitution now that we've said that vagrancy laws are unconstitutional to recreate space for us to uh, be able to arrest potential prisoners. And in fact, the Supreme Court begins that process even before it strikes down a vagrancy law. In the case of Terry v. Ohio, which some of you may be familiar with, it's the stop and frisk case. In 1968, they give police officers the authority to stop and frisk people short of probable cause. And that case happens the same term the court dismisses other vagrancy cases. They take them all, and then they say, we're going to give you this authority, but we don't know if we're ready to take back the authority that you had with vagrancy laws. We're not sure. And they wait. And then a few years later, they do. And they say, OK, we can take it away now. We gave this other authority. And yet, law enforcement said, it's still not enough. We need loitering laws of some kind in order to help us. So my plan had initially been to bring this all the way back around to the Supreme Court. I didn't get to the courts. The courts obviously play an important role, and the judges play an important role. And I have a wonderful story I could tell you. And if someone wants to write it down in the card, I can do it in question and answers, because I don't want to go on for too long. Um, I have a wonderful story about how doctrine does actually matter. I don't mean to be saying in this talk that the only people who create constitutional change are the Sam Thompsons of the world. I think the court is incredibly important. And I don't think it's only important because it creates decisions and does things, I think the way it does it and the language that it uses and the doctrinal basis that it uses is incredibly important for how people conceive going forward of what the possibilities are. Even if they disagree, especially if they disagree, the way they're going to put their arguments in the future has a lot to do with what the court says. And so the wonderful story I have is about the relationship between Papa Christou, that's the 1972 case striking down vagrancy laws, and Roe v. Wade, which you may not think are related at all, but they are deeply, deeply uh, related. So let me just say, uh, uh, as, we, as we finish, that I, I want to just say uh, four things that I think you can draw out of the stories that I've been telling about how Constitution changes, how the Constitution changes. The first is that it's not linear. There's no single story. It is many different actors and many institutions dynamically interacting over the course of time, and that's why Constitution is key. Anyone can join in so long as they think that they are a part of this happening. 
Second, there's a tremendous amount of movement between what scholars have often called internal and external. Those categories, I think, are problematic. Um, but it is the case that you can see in the story movement from individuals and social movements into legal categories, back out to social movements and back into legal categories as the referent in both law and society changes and more and more people get involved in challenging these laws and changing the Constitution. Third, as I just said, doctrine is important, not so much because it constrains what judges actually do, which it may or may not, but because it shapes our constitutional imaginations about what is possible. And fourth, constitutional change is part of our lived experience. We all live in the constitutional world that was created September 17th, 1787, right? This is our foundational document. And we all live within it, whether we're thinking actively about it or not. It's empowering to think that the law and constitutional change is not something that happens over there by those professional people. It's something that we're all a part of. It began the day the Constitution was ratified. And the Constitution provides this touchstone for debate, for conflict, for appeals to the foundational doctrine and uh, the plan and the the, the interpretation and the change of which we are all a part. So go to the Metro and get your constitution. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Should I tell my story while we're reading? Yes? Okay. Uh, all right, I'll tell my story while we're reading. So in the 1971 term, Roe v. Wade first comes up. The reason why you don't think it's 1971 or 1972 is because Roe was decided in 73, but it's held over and re-argued. So Papa Cristo and Roe are at the court at the same time. And in the conference, it's decided that Papa Cristo will be decided as too vague. I was talking about void for vagueness. And Roe would be decided as a fundamental rights case. But when Justice Douglas sits down to write Papa Christu, he writes it as a fundamental rights case. And he writes that the fundamental rights include things like walking, strolling, wandering, and loafing. And the reason that they are important is because he says they give us the feeling of independence and self-confidence, the feeling of creativity. And he talks about the right to deny submissiveness. I mean, he is imagining rights to lives of high spirits rather than hushed, suffocating silence. And he's not, this isn't just rhetoric in his early draft. He thinks that these rights will get the kind of scrutiny First Amendment rights get. He is creating rights that are directly coming out of the 60s and ideas about nonconformity. Meanwhile, Justice Blackmun writes his first draft of the opinion as a void for vagueness case. And I'm not the first to say this. Linda Greenhouse and others have talked about this. But he avoids the fundamental rights issue. So they've switched places the first time. And then Justice Brennan says to Justice Douglas, huh, I'm a little worried that you might, if you go for this big, big idea about fundamental rights, people are going to get put off from Roe, and maybe we shouldn't do that. And in fact, Justice Stewart says, I'm not signing on to that. I'm only signing on to void for vagueness. So Douglas changes his opinion. And it ends up being a void for vagueness opinion. Meanwhile, Blackman circulates his void for vagueness opinion. And Douglas and Brennan says, nah, -uh, we said fundamental rights. And so he rewrites it, and it becomes a fundamental rights opinion. But it's not just that these things swap. It's that during this period, at least Douglas and Brennan are writing memos to each other in which they think that these cases are related. Because the question in both cases is, what are fundamental rights? Where in the Constitution will we protect them? What are the contours of them? Do they exist in private? Do they exist in public? What kinds of rights are we talking about? And so if you think about the possibility of Papa Christu, and then you think about the reality of Roe, you realize the kind of rights we got were rights that all revolve around privacy. Now, as Rehnquist, Justice Rehnquist points out in his dissent in Roe, it's a weird thing to talk about an abortion as a private act, right? Most of the time, you go to a hospital or a clinic or a doctor. It's not private in that sense, but it is private in the sense that it's about your own bodily integrity, about your sexual and reproductive choices. Um, and so the constellation of rights that now make up substantive due process in the wake of Roe are largely about privacy and uh, family and reproduction and sexuality. They are not about 
lives of high spirits and nonconformity and not living hushed, suffocating silence and being able to go in public space where you want to go. Uh, Douglas actually retains that language, and he builds on it in later cases. Um, he doesn't just lose it. And in fact, there are two uh, law professors actually at UVA in 1977, very moderate people who write a law review article called the, right to, the Constitutional Right to a Lifestyle. I mean, this was a real idea that, that you had these kinds of public rights that we lose when Roe and Papa Chris do switch places. So are there questions? <laughs> Excellent. So that's a great question. And it actually has been quite significant. Uh, it hasn't been significant in number. We, we don't have that many constitutional amendments. But I would say it's been significant in a few ways. First, many of the amendments we have, not all of them, some are technical, you know, about succession or things like that. But many of the amendments we have have been revolutionary to the Constitution. And there are two periods in particular where that was the case. The first one was the Reconstruction Amendments after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. There, there weren't actually uh, individual, oh, and the, so I would say the first First is the Bill of Rights, right? In the original document, there aren't really original rights, uh, individual rights. They come in the Bill of Rights, and then they come again uh, in the Reconstruction Amendments. And then the third time I would mention is right around the 20th century, when uh, you get uh, women's suffrage, you get prohibition, you get a whole bunch of amendments that are really about uh, you get the change in the way senators are elected from appointed by state legislatures to elected by the people. Um, which all increase the relationship, the direct relation between the federal government and individuals. No longer the family, the father, the patriarch is the intermediary for voting. No longer the states are the intermediary. It's the federal government acting directly on the citizenry or vice versa. So I think that even though we haven't had that many, they've been really important. And I would say that the second thing is we've had many hundreds of proposed constitutional amendments. And I think those are important. I think it's important one can see what people thought was necessary at various times. And a lot of the reason why we don't have more is because of constitutional interpretation, the way interpretation of the document has changed. So the best example of this, I think, is the ERA. The Equal Rights Amendment is proposed in order to uh, give women equal rights. And what happens instead, the Equal Rights Amendment fails, but the 14th Amendment is reinterpreted, the Equal uh, Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment is reinterpreted to include include discrimination on the basis of sex. So you no longer need the ERA. Now you can talk about causation and which comes first, but there is definitely the sense that similar things happened in the 1930s when the court was resisting uh, the New Deal. There were lots of proposals to amend the Constitution in order to allow for greater economic regulation, but instead what happens is the judicial opinions change and the interpretation of the Constitution changes such that greater federal regulation is allowed. Okay, so that's a good question. So usually when scholars are talking about internal and external, what they mean are, to put it crudely, internal and external inputs into how and why law changes. So one would say that the law changes, I mean, people have lots of different views on why law changes. But I would say that the law changes as a result of both internal and external inputs. Uh, and there's a, a famous uh, diagram in a, a law review article from some time ago that had what it called the law box. Uh, and it had inputs going into the law box and outputs coming out of the law box. Most scholars don't think about it that way anymore, that you put in opinions, uh, precedent, treatises, and you get out a new judicial opinion, right? It's much more, as I've been saying in my talk, much more dynamic, many more actors. But it's still the case that people think that some of what goes on has to do with previous opinions, legal categories, are you going to make a claim that this is a violation of the Due Process Clause or a claim that this is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause? Is it a claim against... Is it a claim? Is that anything we have to listen to? Is it, or should we worry? Um, uh, is, it, is it a claim, you know, how, how do legal professionals think about this and what are the constraints and opportunities within formal legal processes and precedent versus things that go on outside of the law 
uh, uh, formally thought of. So things like social movements, things like uh, individual experiences. Now, part of the problem is what you, how you define internal and external, and scholars have been uh, quite careful in recent years to say it's really hard to define them, right? Uh, is the fact that you're in a law firm versus a public defender's office uh, is, is that internal or external, right? The, the organization of your professional life, would you call that internal or external? And by a similar token, uh, it's hard to talk about internal and external because they are always in, interacting with and shaping the other that how do you even say what one is or what the other is, right? As I said, we have lived with this regime of this constitution even as it's changed for 200 years, right? We are all part of it. How we think about the world is partly determined by it. So even our social movements are internal in, in, to an extent, and even our opinions are external to an extent because they're determined by the social movement. So um, the categories are porous, they're dynamic, they're interactive, but they're an easy shorthand to talk about different kinds of actors and institutions that play a role in the constitutional change process. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.